your lives. Uh, we're going to spotlight each night some of the testimonies that we did and on camera. And tonight's testimonies all have something in common. Uh, they all have a religious background. They started with a religion, and that religion created some confusion in their lives. And later, through going to the fog of religion, they were able to come to meet Jesus as their personal Savior. And so with that, why don't you take about seven minutes and enjoy some of the testimonies of some people in our church. Um, my uh, faith story uh, started when I was very young. Um, I was born in a Christian home, um, immediately uh, taken to church um, from my parents. They brought me in, um, and I always grew up um, with that, um, being taught, um, Bible being taught clearly, um, always hearing about um, Jesus dying for my sins, and it's something that um, I, I believed. And I didn't really have um, difficulty in um, rejecting that or um, if that was true or not. I became a Christian when I was four years old. My parents were both Christians already, but at that time in their lives, they were not going to church, not taking us to church, but they were still at home uh, teaching us about God. And my dad took a job for Wheaton College and they became involved in a new church start called the West Chicago Bible Church. After we were there for some time, I was, when I was about five years old, uh, Pastor Frost, the pastor of the church, invited a man named Gaylord Smith, the children's evangelist, to come and speak to the church. I was saying I'm like 15. And it was after um, an Awana uh, meeting where um, the teacher actually was um, going through John 3.16 and um, putting my name in the verse, um, for God so loved David, um, that it really um, just hit home to me. Um, I was about seven or eight years old. Um, and I went back home um, and talked to my dad about it that night. And uh, I gave my life to Christ, I asked him my sins and be the savior of my life. And I vaguely remember it, but I do remember being in my bedroom one night with my parents, going to bed and uh, asking Jesus to forgive me for my sins. Um, and it was probably within the next year that we did start going to church and have been in church ever since. Yeah, I'm 316 for God, so I'm going to have his only begotten son, that whoever believed in him cannot perish but have everlasting life. Because sometime not long after that, she explained the way to, of salvation to me, and uh, I accepted the Lord at my mother's guidance in our family home. Uh, I marked my salvation from that point, and uh, when I was 10 years old in 1954, in August, I uh, followed uh, my commitment by being baptized, and again it was uh, Dr. Gene Frost who did that. And uh, that's basically my testimony. Jesus said, get up and come and walk with me. Let me remind you that God never wanted you to be religious. He has never intended you and programmed you to connect with Him through any system or any ideology or any set of books of theology. God never wanted you to be religious. He wants to have a relationship with you that can only come through Jesus Christ. 
Religion fogs the issue. It tells you if you bow a certain way, if you go to church on a certain day, if you pray a certain direction, if you light enough candles, and if you're just good enough, then you can go to heaven. And God says, that's none of it. I don't want any of your man-made things. I want you to know my son is your personal savior. Religion is all about you controlling God. It's about you telling God where you'll meet him, and about how you'll meet him, on what grounds you will meet him, and it's about you controlling God. If you're taking notes tonight, our one simple truth tonight is this. God does not operate on my timetable. God does not operate on my timetable. You came to know God through one simple way, faith. You came into this relationship with God through faith that what Jesus Christ did on the cross was enough for you. But let me just say this to you. After you've accepted Christ as your personal Savior, God lives the exact same way. God operates and works through faith. And he will not be controlled by you, and he will not be controlled by any religious group or any church or any pastor or any man in a funny dress. He will not tell be controlled by anybody. God works only through faith. Amen? Sort of the key verse of chapter 11 is this. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. God works with faith. And as we sort of apply this to your life, I want you to get this one truth here. By faith, God creates a great story in our lives. By faith, God creates a great story in our life. Faith is simply this. Following when you're not sure. Following when you don't see. Following when you don't know the outcome. You see, anybody can do the right thing. Anybody can live their life a certain way if they already know the outcome. Anybody can uh, act a certain way if they already know the end. And if you like, like, like I like to read books, read the last page so you know who killed them, right? Anybody can live their life if they already know exactly how everything's going to take place. But it is through faith that I follow God and trust Him. Even when it's not guaranteed, it is by faith. See, God's going to have to tell a great story in someone's life. Someone's going to have a marriage brought back together. Someone's going to have a son come off of drugs. Someone's going to see a grandchild accept Christ as their personal Savior. Someone's going to see their family become whole. God's going to tell a great story. But it's going to require faith. Will it be your family? Will it be your story that God's going to work in? Let me ask you two questions. Number one, it's in your notes, but how would your life be different if you followed Jesus? How would your life be your... Please, let's go beyond this. You're here on a Saturday night, so you have some sort of dedication to God. I'm assuming most of us have accepted Christ as our personal Savior. Can we just go a little bit beyond the, the, the boundary of rules and everything? And we need rules, we need guidelines, don't misunderstand me. But if we went beyond that and just sort of said, I'm going to live my life by faith in God, and just simply say yes to every opportunity that Jesus brings to me, whether it be to share my faith, whether it be to step out in faith, whether it be my children, whether it be my family, whether it be my checkbook, whatever. How would your life be different if you simply follow Jesus? And parents, let me ask you this question. How would other people's lives be different if you follow Jesus? Where would your daughter be, sir, if you actually got right with God and started by faith following Him? Where would your son be, ma'am, if instead of having a mom who has a religion, he had a mom who had a personal relationship with God and then started applying it to every aspect of his life? How would your life be different, but how would someone else's life be different? Hebrews chapter 11 is all about the heroes of faith. It's the heroes who chose God's path who chose a difficult way, but yet through faith, even though they did not see the outcome, they still followed God. Tonight we're going to look at Abraham, which is going to take a journey of faith. Romans chapter 4, Paul tells us that Abraham is the father of faith. Galatians chapter 3 tells us that all of us who are uh, followers of faith and have accepted Christ, we are the heirs of Abraham. If you've ever been in junior church, that's why we sing that song, Father Abraham. That's how you torture kids. Or at least the people who have to sing the song. The Old Testament saints, listen, were saved by faith. Abraham was not saved by keeping the law or good works. Abraham was saved by faith. He looked forward to the cross. He accepted whatever revelation God had given. It was very small. But he knew that God had a plan and that God was going to send the Messiah. We look back to the cross exactly how? 
through faith. We know the stories. We know the outcome. We know Bethlehem, the cross. We know the name of Jesus. Abraham knew none of that, but he knew simply from Genesis 3.15. He knew simply that God was going to provide a way to connect people back with him spiritually. And by faith, by faith, Abraham was saved. And he stepped out and followed God. What Abraham did required faith. We're going to see the three things tonight that faith requires. Number one, in Hebrews chapter 11, it requires an answer to God's call. Look at verse 8 with me. This is a, uh, by faith, uh, this is a common phrase we're going to look at. By faith, it appears repeatedly through chapter 11. Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place, if you'd like to put notes in your Bible, jot down Genesis 12, 1 through 3, because this is the passage it's talking about here in Hebrews 11. Abraham is going to be called by God to leave his homeland. It's called Ur of the Chaldees. Basically what most theologians believe, it's basically now present-day Iraq. Some would disagree. But it seems pretty much it's right there in Baghdad is where Abraham came out of. In this next passage to follow, there are three important calls that God is going to make us to do. God is going to ask us to have three important calls. Number one, the call to salvation. Look at verse 8. Which he should receive for an inheritance. The inheritance that we receive, that we receive by faith, the inheritance we receive is heaven. Now Abraham, yes, he is acting out and he is going forward by faith and he is saved at this point. But Abraham is looking for a new land. He's looking for a city whose builder and maker is God. If you're going to come to God, it's going to require faith. You see, we've been taught religion. We've been taught that we go to God through another man. We've been taught that we go to God through a special prayer. We've been taught that we go to God through insert whatever thing that your religious background might have told you. That is not how we go to God. There is only one way through God, and it is faith in Jesus Christ. If you've done that, say amen. amen. I just challenge you tonight that that is a call that God is making for you. And as you listen to those testimonies, they all had a, they all had a different beginning. But they all had one thing in common where each one of them made a personal decision to receive Christ. One said, ask Him to come into their heart. One said, be the Lord of their life. One said, that was the time when I was saved. I don't really care how you use the terms, but there must be a time in your story of your life where you made a direct decision by faith to receive Jesus Christ. There's a calling for salvation. Second, Christian, there's a calling of holiness. What did Abraham do? Look at verse 8. One simple word. Obey. God wants us to come out of the world and obey Him. May I challenge you tonight to examine your life for sin, for rebellion, uh, for relationships that aren't correct, young people in your life? Obey. And lastly, the, end, the calling is the calling to make an impact. The calling to make an impact. Look back at verse 8. And he went out not knowing whether he would. Let me just make this analogy. I'm going to use an example. Uh, Nate, my son, come here. Derek, come here. And uh, Dave, come here. Just stand here behind me. Young people, listen, senior citizens, if you haven't listened to preaching for the last 30 years, why are you going to listen to me? <laughs> God has called you to make an impact on this world. Young people, the average person has about 20,000 days in their life. What are you going to do with those 20,000 days? Are you going to make an impact for Jesus Christ? Or in those 20,000 days, are you going to have fun? Are those 20,000 days, are you going to get high? In those 20,000 days, are you going to experience every sexual type of activity you could? In those 20,000 days, are you going to insert whatever issue, whatever thing you think life is about? You have 20,000 days to make an impact on this planet. What will you do with it? But I'm going to show you another thing about an impact. Dave, come over here. Yeah. Once you guys get shoulder to shoulder. There you go. Shoulder to shoulder. Um, we make an impact on other people's lives. I'm going to demonstrate good and bad. This is the bad. Let's just sort of say that these are three generations. And Nate's the youngest one down here. Derek's the middle, the dad, and, and big man. <laughs> it's like the very first of the generation. Now, if I come to Dave... This work with me, right? If I come to Dave and I push him, Nate moves, doesn't he? If something makes an impact on granddad, it's going to affect son and it's going to affect grandson. And by the way, don't you know families? 
Somebody picked up a bottle and that just stayed with the family from generation to generation to generation. Somebody picked up a drug or somebody picked up some issue. Somebody picked up materialism. And it just stayed from generation to generation and made an impact all the way down. So let's look at shoulder to shoulder. Come on. Work with the people. Uh, Dave, let's say Dave is the first of this family, the first of this line, this impact. Gentlemen, this is you. Some of you low guys, this is you. You're, you're, you're diddling with stuff that is going to make an impact on the next three generations. And Dave is listening to some negative. Dave gets involved in sin. Fight back, Chloe. Fight back, fight back. All right? And he's kind of prepared for it. He's messing around with something that he shouldn't be. Insert whatever you want. And he's, look, and Dave can kind of fight and hold me off, can't he? He can kind of keep that impact from happening back here. But Dave, what do you do? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I should have got Nate on the side. But if I came and went real hard and well, you know I don't want to get hurt here. But if I came real hard, now see, I'm, that's how Satan operates. You think that you can in your own ability sort of dabble in sin, dabble with issues, and hold off him and as, as he goes. And you say, well, I'll be ready. I'll constantly be ready. But here's the thing. He pushes and he pushes. He pushes and he pushes. And when you think you've kind of got your sin figured out, he pushes you from another way. Amen? That's right. And what happens is, shoulder to shoulder, one person in a family just lets their guard down. And it goes all the way down to generation to generation. But can I show you the good side of this? What happens if one person in the, in the family decides to let God impact them on every aspect of their life? Decides to let the Holy Spirit blow across them and just say, God, wherever you push me, whatever you need me to do, I will go, God. If you want me to go to another place, I will go. If you want me to be something, I will be. I will go to Africa. I will go to Mars if there are people there you want me to tell them about. What if one person decides to let God make a positive impact on their life? You see, some of us, and next week we're going to talk about those of us like me, raised in church, we're here. We're here only because our grandparents accepted Christ. We're here because our mom and dad accepted Christ. I'm here because my grandfather went into Central Free Will Baptist Church and accepted Jesus. Walked in a good Irish drunk, gambler, drinker, everything. Walked out a born-again believer. Never touched a drop, never did any of that. And he impacted my father, who impacted me. You see, the bad is true, and I want you to know that. You're, you're allowing things, you're playing with sin that's going to go all the way down and make an impact. But can I also tell you this? There's also the positive. When you completely, by faith, surrender to God, who knows who you're impacting? Thanks, guys. Amen? Amen. Dad, today you have a chance to bless the next three generations, or you have a chance to curse the next three generations. You see, God is going to tell a great story. God is going to tell a great story and He's going to do something great in somebody's family. Will it be yours? And see, He can fix your family. God could fix your family if He was the leader of the family. God could fix your marriage if He owned your marriage. God can fix all of your career issues and everything else you're not sure about what you're supposed to do. If God got to decide where you worked and what you did, God is going to tell a great story. Will you answer the call and let him impact you? Number two, faith requires a willingness to just be for God. Abraham had a lot of things in her. He's a very wealthy man. And he leaves a very wealthy man and he travels hundreds of miles and in that process, he lives in a tent. Can I ask you this? By faith, can you just be? Can you be poor if that's what God wants? Can you live in an unfulfilled relationship if that brings honor and glory to God? Can you be sick and struggle with illness if that brings glory to God, can you just be? Can you have difficulties and issues in your life? But if they bring honor and glory to God, can you just be? Abraham left his wealthy home, left his comfortable bed to live in a tent. And he was just whatever God wanted him to be. You know the greatest marriage advice? We, we, we had our marriage little class. 
class that we did, and as we went through it all a couple Saturdays ago, one of the best marriage advice that came out of that is just do the right thing, and by faith, expect nothing in return. Sir, can you simply love your wife and do the right thing because it brings honor and glory to God and expect nothing in return? Most people, when they come to me and complain about their husband and their wives, they always sort of say, I do all of this and he doesn't, or she won't, or she, I do all of this and why? And we expect to do one thing and then have something else in return. Listen, you want to revolutionize your marriage, your relationships with people, your job, everything. You do the right thing, not because it's the right thing to do. You do the right thing because it honors and glorifies God. You do the right thing and expect nothing in return because by faith, by faith, you're trusting that God will take care of you. Amen? Vengeance is mine, but I'm going to go flatten their tires. <laughs> it is not a coincidence that God mentions his family in this. Look at verse 9. By faith he sojourned in the land of promise as a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles or tents. I'm not a camper. My idea of roughing it is a hotel without room service. But he's living in a tent, and not only does he is, he's with his kids. With Isaac and Jacob, their heirs, with him with the same promise. It's amazing how God just sort of slips that in there. Um, your kids are with you. Are your kids worth? What are your kids worth? Are they worth losing a promotion because you did the right thing? Are your kids worth this coming summer? Are your kids worth you being here in church every possible opportunity and foregoing a chance to be out on the lake on a boat? Now see, it was really good until I got to that point, wasn't it? <laughs> Is, are your kids worth missing a hunting trip? Or a golf trip? Golf's a four-letter word anyways. <laughs> but God's going to tell a great story. Which side will you be on? And sometimes God just wants us to be. Just be. And by faith, I'm going to trust that God's going to work everything else out. God has put you here by faith, whatever issues, whatever problems, can you just be and be what God wants you to be today? And number three, the last thing faith requires, an eye on God's future promise. We're going to close this out. Look at verse 10. For he looked for a city which had foundations. Remember, Abraham left a great earthly city to follow God. First in a tent, whose builder and maker is God. People with great stories, people that they build monuments to and they build uh, uh, statues to are people who with overwhelming odds or chaos or issues going on kept their head and did the right thing. Uh, a few days ago was the 170th anniversary, I believe, of the Alamo. Uh, brave men and then Travis's letter, just an amazing letter, what he says on that. But we honor the people of the Alamo and very few people know about the Alamo is that everybody in the Alamo died. And people think of the Alamo, they think of a great victory. It wasn't a great victory, but it was just simply people who in the midst of chaos, in the midst of a horrible thing going on, decided to do the right thing and take a stand. Now I suggest to you that your grandkids will remember you more when you take a stand in the midst of chaos and in the midst of everything going wrong and you chose to do the right thing. Nobody ever built a statue to honor the father who walked out of their family. Nobody ever built a statue to honor the mother who walked away from her kids. Nobody ever built a statue to the town drunk. Nobody ever built her or loved a memorial or thought highly of the person who stole money. But what they do is they build statues to people and they build memorials and they remember people who in the midst of chaos did the right thing. By faith, keep your eye on God's future. And how does he describe this? Look at verse 13. We're just going to close with this. These all died in faith, not having received the promise. They didn't get to see everything, but by faith. Having seen them afar, they were persuaded of them and embraced them. For they say such things declared plainly that they seek a country. And truly, if they be mindful of that country from whence they came out, they might have an opportunity to have returned. But now they desire a better country. That is a heavenly, whereby God is not ashamed to be called their... Let me phrase that again. God is not ashamed to be called their God, for He hath prepared for them a city. God is going to tell a great story. Will it be yours? 
Will your story be one of things got tough and it got difficult in our marriage and he wasn't what he was supposed to be and, and, and it was really hard and I just left? Is that the story you want to tell? Or is your story going to be one of, you know, it was very tough and we lost the house because of the economy and, and, and she got sick. And after she got sick, I, I stayed with her and I nursed her back to health. And you know what? It was, it was really difficult. For 20 years, she was unable to, it was just a hard time. But I stayed. By faith, God is going to tell a great story in someone's life. Hey, is your story going to be, my son went off and he got involved in a lifestyle I don't like and I just, I just thought it was horrible so I told him, you are no longer my son and I want nothing to do with you and I don't care about you and I just had a funeral for him and I wanted nothing. Or is your story going to be one of that my son got involved and it was just difficult but yet by faith, I still loved him. By faith, I kept crying out to God to change him. By faith, God is going to tell a great story. What story do you want to tell? Last thing in our notes is this. Desperation determines decisions. And I will illustrate this in close. I have a lot of monk in me. If you ever watch the TV show Monk. I'm a borderline germaphobe. I don't like messes. I got a lot of issues that my mother instilled in me. I blame her. One of the things, I like to drink water. I like to drink a lot of water. I always, I always have some water and everything. Well, Monday or Sunday night after a while, uh, I, I taught my class up here in internal security. Wanda was going on, helped out with some other things. It was just crazy. Everybody finally left, and I sat down out there, and I sat down, and I had this. There was a bottle of water on the table, and here's the thing: the Hermans like to drink water too, and some other people in our church like to drink water. And the Hermans sit out there at the table and everything. And I sat down at that table, and I was just so tired and so thirsty. And I looked at this bottle of water, and I said to myself, there's a 50-50 chance of mine. <laughs> and that meant there's another 50% chance it's somebody else. But I was so tired. I was so thirsty. I really didn't care at that moment. I thought, well, let's test my immune system. Now, most of the time, I would never do that. Because I have options. There's a water fountain. I have other bottled water. There's a jug of water in my refrigerator. I have options. But when I got desperate enough, I didn't care. You see, what keeps you from living by faith and serving God by faith, you have options. you got good credit. You have a good job. You have a good living. You and your wife just clip together naturally. You don't really need Jesus in your marriage. You have options. But when you finally get down to a moment of desperation, You'll finally say whatever you want to